Dear distinguished guests, welcome back to 2021 Taiwan US Japan Trilateral Indo Pacific Security Dialogue. And now we'll proceed to the panel discussion one Congressional Dialogue on Prospects of Taiwan US Japan Cooperation. Before the panel discussion officially starts, there are some ground rules of the QA announcement. First, the whole process will be conducted in English. Second, before asking your questions, please state your name and organization and keep your question within two minutes. Our staff will ring bell when there is only 30 seconds left. On the other hand, regarding to the topic, we have two distinguished guests from US and Japan to address their talks. Firstly, let's welcome His Excellency Bill Haggerty, Senator of the US Senate. Dr. Chen. My colleagues from Japan and Taiwan, and my friends from the United States, it's an honor and a privilege to join you today at the 2021 Indo-Pacific Security Dialogue. I'd like to start by recalling the origin of the term, the Indo-Pacific. In 2007, Prime Minister Abe delivered a speech in India highlighting the emergence of a new, quote, broader Asia that's taken shape at the confluence of the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. Long before others, Japan recognized the changing undercurrents in the region. More importantly, Japan had the foresight to develop a new framework to rally the democratic nations located at opposite ends of the two oceans. That vision is what we call today the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. The Free and Open Indo-Pacific describes an overarching framework supported by a growing number of the countries in the world to strengthen a regional partnership based on rule of law, freedom of navigation, free trade, and the commitment to peace and stability with respect for international law and territorial integrity. It's critical for the United States, Japan, and Taiwan as three indispensable cornerstones to continue to stand shoulder to shoulder in order to address common challenges in the Indo-Pacific. It's plain to see that the Chinese Communist Party aims not only to achieve dominance in the world's most vibrant and rapidly growing region, but also to fundamentally revise the environment here, placing the People's Republic of China at the center and serving Beijing's authoritarian and hegemonic ambitions. The defense of Taiwan and Japan lies at the center of pushing back against the Chinese Communist Party's revisionist ambitions. As Japanese Defense Minister Nobu Kishi said, quote, the peace and stability of Taiwan are directly connected to Japan. I'm glad to see that the Biden administration has continued to build upon the strong strategy for the Indo-Pacific that it inherited from the Trump administration. For example, in April 2021, it was encouraging to see President Biden and then Prime Minister Suga publicly agree to underscore the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and to encourage the peaceful resolution of cross-strait issues. Under the new leadership of Prime Minister Kishida, I fully expect the United States and Japan will continue to deepen cooperation on the issue of Taiwan. Another vital dimension of the competition with China is enhancing economic cooperation among the United States, Japan, and Taiwan. As U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I work with Prime Minister Abe and his team on a new U.S.-Japan trade agreement to lower trade barriers and to strengthen our nation's economic ties. We need to see similar types of economic integration between our three countries. As part of that effort, I hope the United States and Taiwan succeed in concluding a significant agreement on trade. As advanced economies, the United States, Japan, and Taiwan play critical roles in developing new technologies and international standards of the global economy to enhance global economic prosperity while countering predatory actions by the Chinese Communist Party. I strongly urge our three governments to work together to strengthen economic linkages, particularly through quality infrastructure in accordance with international standards. Last but not least, we must be clear about what we stand for. Over the past seven decades, the United States, Japan, and Taiwan have been at the vanguard of defending democracy and freedom in the Indo-Pacific. What's at stake here is our way of life, the freedom to speak your mind, the freedom to believe in your religion, the freedom to prosper. We should never forget this. Thank you. Okay, many thanks to Senator Bill Haggerty's address. And next, let's welcome the Honorable Keiji Furuya, Chairman of Japan ROC Diet Members Consultative Council and a member of the House of Representatives in the Diet of Japan for the speech. Now, please welcome. 
Greetings. Upon this occasion, I extend my heartfelt regards to those of you in the Republic of China and the United States. My name is Keiji Furuya, and I serve as chairman of the Japan ROC Diet Members Consultative Council. Our council is a Diet Members League with membership of approximately 300 by by uh, uh, parliamentarians from both Japan and Taiwan. To be, I sincerely thank and congratulate everyone involved in the stellar effort to uh, convene this Taiwan-US-Japan Trilateral Indo-Pacific Security Dialogue. Today, from the Japan side, we are pleased to present a message from our former Prime Minister, Mr. Shinzo Abe. Likewise, participating in the dialogue with legislators from the ROC and the United States will be Ms. Haruko Arimura, Deputy Secretary General of the Japan ROC Diet Members Consultative Council. In recent years, Nations around the world have been advancing vigorous activity in support of Taiwan. Today, we are witnessing a one-sided push by mainland China, rooted in a clearly abdominal course of action, aimed at altering the global status quo. Against such a backdrop, it is crucial for uh, those of US, Japan, Taiwan, and the United States to join hand with other nations which respect the basic values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, devoting our shared energies to the causes of global peace and stability. On this July 29th, the Consultative Council sponsored a historical strategic dialogue by uh, national legislator from Japan, the United States, and Taiwan. Taking apart from the U.S. was uh, Senator William Haggerty, and from the ROCU uh, Sinkum, a uh, president of the Legislative U.N. Assembly. Both of these gentlemen are also part of today's discussions. From Japan, we are happy to have former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, as well as a representative from the various Japanese political parties, which also serve as a member of our Consultative Council. The conference was highly informative and fruitful, and we plan to continue to hold regular sessions going forward. Last year, struggling with the rise of COVID-19 pandemic, Japan was greatly honored to receive N95 face masks and hazard protection bodysuits from the ROC. In gratitude for that generosity, Japan worked behind the scenes to arrange for 4.2 million doses of COVID vaccine as support on that front, with those doses supplied to ta Taiwan. In March of this year, mainland China suddenly placed an import ban on Taiwan-grown pineapples. In Japan, that action prompted spontaneous moves to furnish assistance for the ROC through the purchase of its pineapples. This push also included the supermarket chain, Vedo, which is Headquartered by headquartered in my own constituency of Gifu Prefecture. As a result, Taiwanese pineapples quickly emerged as a major presence in retail outlets throughout Japan. This development once again understood the deep bonds of friendship which exist between Taiwan and Japan. It also provided an excellent example of 
how to transform crisis into opportunity. Japan firmly supports the application by the ROC as one of our truly vital partners to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. In moving to help negotiate Taiwanese membership in the TPP, we eagerly look forward to resolution of a number of related issues. Among them, the ROC ban on imports of food products from a total of five Japanese prefectures. Next year marks the 50th anniversary of break off in diplomatic relations between Taiwan and Japan. The following year, 2023, we will celebrate our full half century since the founding of our Japan ROC Diet Members Consultative Council in 1973. As this milestone approaches, we are more determined than ever to redouble the solid bond forged between our nation over the decades. Our aim is to empower the next generation of leaders to continue to build and exit on this foundation of unwavering trust. Thanking to, uh, taking, to, uh, taking this to heart, it is my most uh, profound hope that today's outline exchange will be instrumental in further enhancing the strong bonds of understanding and cooperation between the ROC, the United States, and Japan. Finally, on behalf of everyone at the Japan ROC Diet Members Consultative Council, I thank you for the precious privilege of addressing this esteemed summit of concerned legislators. Thank you. All right, many thanks to Chairman Keiji Furuya. And now we officially start the panel discussion. Please welcome our moderator, Dr. Chen Tangshan, and the panelist, legislator Luo Zhizhen, to come up to the stage. Please welcome. In this session, we also have the Honorable Elaine Luria, Representative, U.S. House of Representatives, and also with the Honorable Haluka uh, Haruko Arimura, member of the House of Consulars, Japan, as our panelist in this panel discussion. Okay, please have a seat. And now I'll turn the floor to our moderator, Dr. Chen Tangshan, please. Uh, thank you very much again. Good morning to every one of you. Uh, this is a session uh, that uh, I'm honored uh, to chair. And uh, I'm even more honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Do Su Zhen right here. And uh, Honorable Haruko. Arimura from Japan, uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, sh she won't be here this morning. But before that, I think we already have seen two video address uh, by uh, uh, Honorable Bill Haggerty, uh, U.S. Senator from Tennessee, and the second one is uh, Mr. Keiji. Uh, Huruya from Japan. So I again want to uh, express our appreciations to uh, those two gentlemen uh, for their support to the uh, democracy and the uh, meeting this morning we have here. So with that uh, brief uh, uh, comment, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my good friend, 
uh, Congressman Bo Su Sun. I have known him for several years and when I was uh, uh, serving as the congressman here in Taiwan. And uh, I know he uh, was, used to be a professor teaching at uh, Dongwu University. Before that time, he also served one time uh, in the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, every time when we have this kind of uh, meeting, he's always been invited to be a part of it. So this morning, uh, we are very happy to have him again. And the second one, uh, we are going to uh, discuss the issues with us is the uh, uh, Animura uh, Haruko. Uh, unfortunately, she won't be able to be here present by herself, but uh, uh, she's going to present also by uh, video. And uh, before that, I think uh, if anybody has question, please just uh, maybe uh, we have a uh, uh, board here. I think we can send message in, and uh, I hope I think uh, uh, we have a very interesting and uh, uh, fruitful discussions this morning uh, in this kind of in this subject. So, with that uh, brief uh, comment, it's my honor to introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Congressman Do Su Sen. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Mark Chen, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor and privilege for me to be invited again to this uh, trilateral security dialogue. Uh, let me start by expressing my gratitude to the uh, three hosts for organizing this very important and timely uh, conference uh, to address the important challenges uh, that democracies are facing in the region and uh, globally. And I believe that many of my statements uh, that I'm going to make today are already known or even agreed to by this uh, well-informed audience. Still, I think it is necessary for me to, uh, to give you uh, my own views on these uh, important issues. Uh, we all know that Taiwan is standing at the forefront of the two opposing camps, uh, the democratic camp and the authoritarian one. The threats and challenges encountered by Taiwan may also take place in other uh, uh, democracies in the future. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact uh, some are already happening. In addition, changes in the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region will have a significant impact on the regional and global political, military, and economic orders. And I believe in this Indo-Pacific region, what will change the balance of regional power overnight is that Taiwan falls into the hands of China. So my argument is very clear and simple. That is, in the face of a rising China, Taiwan and other democracies are facing a whole range of similar and common challenges. For instance, as democracies, our free and open societies offer some vulnerabilities for Beijing to implement its influence operations. For another example, our dependence on China as a trading and investment partner and as a major source of tourism has given China a political leverage in our relations with China. For sure, Taiwan and other democracies have many experiences and lessons that we can share with and learn from each other. More importantly, to cope with such military, economic, political, and diplomatic challenges posed by this more powerful and more aggressive China, we democracies must work together and take concerted actions. And some experts have warned that the risk of military conflict is now at its highest level in decades. Some even argued that the only thing holding back the PLA from a full assault is that China has yet to achieve the overwhelming firepower needed to conquer Taiwan. For those people, the question is not whether China will launch a war, but when it will launch the first strike. We of course, are deeply concerned by the PRC's increasing menacing and provocative, provocative military activities near Taiwan, which are destabilizing and undermining regional peace and stability. And certainly, we must and will do our best to prevent any military conflicts from taking place in the Taiwan Strait. But in the foreseeable future, what worries me more 
is not China's launch of an all-out war against Taiwan, but China's great zone tactics. Just as ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Zi said in his famous book, The Art of War. The, the spring art of war is to subdue the enemy without combat. And I strongly believe that winning a war without combat is still the dominant strategy for Chinese leaders. The frequency and intensity of Chinese war plans circling Taiwan have put a lot of pressure on Taiwan and Taiwan's military in particular. By utilizing this type of gray zone tactics, which stops short of an actual shooting war, China's aim is to subdue Taiwan through attrition and exhaustion. The use of coercive gray zone tactics is also a kind of psychological warfare. The PRC wants to use this gray zone pressure to convince the people in Taiwan that they have no choice but to accept unification on Beijing's terms. It is worth noting that military intimidation is not the only tactics that China uses to, stu to subdue Taiwan without combat. We are actually facing challenges on all fronts. Accordingly, our assessment of threats should also focus on a series of other coercive actions to pressure Taiwan to bend to Beijing's will. Above all, China's influence operations and intelligence activities that target Taiwan have now posed a serious and imminent threat to the national security of Taiwan and other democratic countries. The PRC has been implementing covert, coercive, or corrupting tactics to influence and shape the public discourse and po political outcomes within targeted democracies. Nowadays, we are aware that many of China's influence operations activities go well beyond the kinds of a, a legitimate public diplomacy in which all governments engage. But no country has been impacted politically by China's growing influence and political ambitions as, China, as Taiwan has over the past decades. In the case of Taiwan, the methods of China's influence operations have, inf have included monetary inducements to politicians, business leaders, academics, local grassroots organizations, media, cyberspace influencers, and so on. China also utilizes other means to co-opt or coerce Taiwan's policies in Beijing's favor. The CCP's consistent and strategic efforts to cultivate uh, networks of influence develop long-term uh, dependencies and shape public discourse on China across many facets of politics, business, academia, and society. Unfortunately, many of these efforts are designed to be hidden from public view and often arranged indirectly through process, making it very difficult to assess precisely the degree of interference and the scope of the province. And I think these all sound familiar to our American and Japanese friends today. Obviously, China knows well the vulnerabilities and opportunities that it can exploitate in our, in our free and open society. And in addition, then at the national level, Taiwan is very well aware of the economic risks and political costs that may be caused by our dependence on China's market. That's the reason why over the past few years, our government, our DPP government has been uh, uh, pushing for this kind of new southbound policy with the hope to reaching out to our Southeast Asian countries. But the problem is that although the Taiwanese government works very hard to diversify our trading and investment partners, Taiwan's dependence on China is still very deep. Taiwan's exports increased to a record-breaking 4.9% in 2020, but with China, Hong Kong included, receiving close to 44% of Taiwan's total exports. And that is a 12% increase from 2019. This makes China Taiwan's single most important trading partner and a key source of trade surplus. One of the reasons why Taiwan continues to rely on China is because Taiwan has not been able to join regional trade agreements such as ASEAN, ASEAN Plus One, Plus Three, RCEP, and CPTPP. So joining CPTPP and negotiating 
bilateral free trade agreements with our other countries have now become the most important and priority tasks for our government. And we need our Japanese and American friends for that. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to comment on the weather, uh, the grand strategy that we are having right now, including engagement, you know, uh, uh, you know, engagement, containment, you know, engagement and so on, whether those strategies are working. But we have to admit that our assessment and strategies for the past few decades were wrong or even problematic. Simply put, in the past, we believe that through engagement, China will, could be brought into the international community and would be expected to respect the rule of law and the regional and world order. More importantly, the traditional paradigm suggested that as a consequence of the modernization and development of China's economy, China will gradually and eventually move towards a more open, free, and even democratic society. But obviously, and unfortunately, the result is not the case. Not only is China not becoming more democratic, it is now more authoritarian, and even the market economy is now becoming more and more distorted. To make things worse, China has become more revisionist and more aggressive, not only challenging the regional and world order, but also attempting to influence the domestic politics of other democracies. So, as I mentioned earlier, China's ambition and expansion are comprehensive. Countermeasures against China must also be all-rounded, including politics, economic, military, or even science and technology. And more importantly, China's strategy against the outside world is to divide and defeat, to divide and conquer. So it's very important for us to work together and to come up with a concerted uh, strategy. So let me start, let me finish by my speech by quoting what General MacArthur said 70 years ago. It was a paragraph from a memo on Formosa, meaning Taiwan now, written in 1950 on the eve of the Korean War. It says, as a result, quote, as a result of its geographic location and best potential, utilizing a Formosa by a military power hostile, hostile to the United States may either counterbalance or overshadow the strategic importance of the central and southern flank of the United States' frontline position. Formosa, in the hands of the communists, can be compared to an unsinkable aircraft carrier and submarine tender. And I strongly believe that this insightful evaluation of Taiwan's geostrategic importance still holds to today. And I even think this statement is more correct now than ever. So, dear colleagues, at this very important historical moment, let's work hard together. In fact, we have to work hard together because we know united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Dr. Law, for your uh, very important, uh, interesting comment. I hope I think, uh, our guests will be, uh, uh, if you have any kind of questions, maybe later on, I think uh, after finishing all talks, maybe you can start having your questions coming in. Now, I'd uh, like to introduce our uh, second speaker. I, I, I'm sorry, I think the first time I uh, missed her introductions. Now, uh, I understand she's also online. Uh, she's the Honorable Elaine Luria. She's the representative uh, of the U.S. House of uh, uh, Congress, House of Rep Representative, and she's from the uh, uh, Democrats from the uh, state of Virginia. So, uh, Honorable Luria, please. Can you hear me? Yes, and uh, yep. good Thank morning you. or good evening from uh, Washington. It is uh, such a pleasure to be able to join you today at the Indo-Pacific Security Dialogue. Um, and 
I wanted to give a little bit of introduction by way of my background, um, having had the opportunity to serve for two decades in the United States Navy uh, before serving in my role in Congress and having had the opportunity to be stationed twice in Japan and Yokosuka, Japan, and uh, understand uh, the, the military operations and especially the importance of the Navy uh, within the Indo-Pacific um, area of operations. Um, and my work in Congress, I serve as the vice chair of the U.S. House Armed Services Committee um, and have spent most of my time in Congress with a significant focus um, on our presence in the Western Pacific, um, as well as our force structure and really the type of, of Navy military forces and the U.S. policy, I think, are, are best uh, suited for the cooperation that we're, we're talking about today um, in order to best defend Taiwan, um, essentially, as was described uh, by earlier speakers. Senator Hagerty mentioned um, how China's actions are currently threatening the rule of law, threatening free trade, threatening international order, um, and China's attempts to establish a regional hegemony. And, and I think that the increased cooperation of all of those present at this dialogue is incredibly important um, in making sure that we can work together uh, to prevent uh, the future aims of the, the Chinese, uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, and I think that it is incredibly important, uh, the United States uh, Navy, uh, especially presence uh, within the Indo-Pacific um, area of responsibility. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, talking about the deterrent effect of the Navy for those things that I, I just mentioned, and also um, the legality of a United States uh, response were China to attempt to, to take Taiwan by force. Um, and in that, I mean that Looking at the, the governing uh, documents and, and laws within the United States, the War Powers Act, um, uh, which describes um, when and how uh, the president has the authority to use U.S. military forces to respond, as well as the Taiwan Relations Act, um, uh, which I think uh, everyone here is very familiar with, and the current policy of the United States of strategic ambiguity under the Taiwan Relations Act. And really, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the question, you know, is that strategic ambiguity the policy that we could, we should, uh, as the United States continue to maintain um, towards China with regards to, to Taiwan? And I think that it comes down to one simple thing. I think China either believes that the United States is going to come to the defense of Taiwan, or they do not. Um, and I say they either believe they do or they do not. However, strategic ambiguity applies would imply that they don't know. Um, and I think that there is a really important distinction um, there uh, because you know, I think when we're looking at this, we need to understand is that if China either believes the United States will come to the defense of Taiwan or China does not believe that, does strategic ambiguity, ambiguity still exist? Or has China truly made an assessment of what they believe uh, the United States actions will be and is though not, not knowing, is that enough of a deterrent? And that may have been true uh, for the last 40 years, um, but you know, in my opinion, I think that, that we need to have a, a very strong debate um, here in the United States. And personally, I think it is not true um, that that strategic ambiguity remains a, an effective enough um, deterrent um, to China. Um, and I also think that we need to look carefully at what we mean uh, from the United States, from U.S. forces and U.S. forces working with our allies. What we mean when we say things like the defense of Taiwan, um, is that defense a deterrent defense, i.e. a defense of presence within the region um, and a credible deterrent to China to prevent them uh, from attempting uh, the use of force against uh, Taiwan? Um, or are we building a force in our, our operational plans, um, those that could only be enacted after an act had already taken place, essentially a fait accompli? Um, and I think that takes me back to my initial comment about uh, U.S. policy um, and the uh, what I wrote recently in a Washington Post article um, was that I feel that the president's hands are tied uh, because if China were to act uh, militarily against Taiwan and the speed with which they did that, and were they to do that without adequate uh, indications and warning in order for a decision to be made, I, if the president actually had to come to Congress to have that authority in order to respond, um, would it be too late? Um, and do we need to put mechanisms in place uh, by which we can respond more rapidly uh, were China to be able to, to take those actions? And I, I truly believe that um, the U.S. position um, should be that the United States will act to maintain the status quo. 
Um, I think that um, it is very important. This is a piece I think is missing from the Taiwan's Relations Act. Um, and, and that the United States should clearly indicate um, that we will act in order to maintain the status quo. And I think that we need to build a force and deploy uh, United States ships and aircraft um, to the region accordingly um, in order to be able to provide that defense. And so what would that mean? What would that look like? I think that would include um, a very large naval force essentially tethered within a certain distance um, from Taiwan. And we, we all know that the United States has forces, a carrier strike group stationed in Yokosuka, Japan, and uh, amphibious ready group, Marine Expeditionary uh, Force, um, all in the Western Pacific um, operating continuously and other rotational forces. But uh, much of the work that I've done in Congress is to look at the future force structure of the United States Navy and what types of forces do we have the right forces? Are we building the right types and number of ships and deploying them in the appropriate way um, in order to effectively uh, provide that uh, deterrent force? Um, and so it would mean that we would need to be present and also have the legal authority to act in a way that would prevent China from forcefully overtaking uh, Taiwan. And I've also uh, tried to consider those means by which that could uh, take place that are less overt than a direct military attack. Um, another thing that uh, could be considered, and I think that we should have um, the ability to respond to, although uh, would also be considered an act of war, uh, but a naval blockade of Taiwan, for example. Um, other things such as overt um, election tampering, not just interference, but tampering. Um, we, we focused earlier on on the, the nature of Taiwan as a, a democracy and want to be able to make sure um, that there's not an overt attack on the democratic process, as well as the opportunity uh, potentially for China to act uh, via cyber attacks. Um, so I think that uh, for the United States to say that we are committed to defending Taiwan, I think there are many elements to that. Um, and I think that obviously our, our first opportunity should be to prevent um, any sort of invasion, attack of any of the types of natures that I described uh, from taking place in the first place. But I think that um, the force that we have within the region, the policies, the response that the United States should be prepared to make uh, would make the prospect too costly uh, for China um, in order to attempt uh, to, to take uh, Taiwan militarily. So I'll finish my comments uh, essentially by saying that I think it is it is time um, to move beyond strategic ambiguity um, to a certainty um, to say that it is it is time for the United States to make a commitment that we will take the necessary force in order to take, maintain uh, the status quo. So um, thank you again uh, for having me as a participant in tonight's panel. And I've really uh, enjoyed um, hearing from the other panelists and look forward to the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Representative Luria, I, I, I must tell you, I, I, I spent uh, several years in the state of Virginia. <laughs> so, uh, I feel we very happy to have you uh, online uh, with us. Now, I think uh, let's uh, proceed to have uh, uh, Honorable Haruko Arimura, member of the House of uh, uh, Councils of Japan, uh, to give us uh, uh, her own remarks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, my Amer my um, Asian colleagues, and good evening to my American friends. My name is Haruko Arimura. I'm speaking from Tokyo office, Japan. I'm a member of House of Representatives, like an upper house in the States. And please call me Ali. And first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important and timely Taiwan, US, Japan trilateral Indo Pacific security dialogue. I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Tan San Chen, Chairman of the Prospect Foundation, as well as to the organizers and all participants. When I think about Indo Pacific region, I realize that it is home to half of the world's population and it is the core of world's vitality. At the same time, it is a region which has seen complex power relations at work and has experienced drastic shifts in the regional power balance. 
It also faces various threats such as piracy, terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and natural disasters. In our common region, we must establish a rule-based international order and firmly establish the principles that are indispensable for achieving regional stability and prosperity, such as free trade, freedom of navigation, and the rule of law. This is the essence of the idea of free and open Indo-Pacific, what we call FIPE, and Japan is strongly leading the efforts under this idea in cooperation with like-minded countries and regions. In this context, I believe that the collaboration among partners and friends who share fundamental values such as democracy and human rights like Japan, Taiwan, and the United States will be the major force in shaping the future of the Indo-Pacific region and will be a great hope for the people of region. With this conviction, I'd like to discuss with today's participants how Japan, Taiwan, and the United States should work together and take concrete steps. A first target um, would be the participation of Taiwan as an observer in the World Health Assembly. Today, as a representative of the Japanese House of Counselors, Japanese Diet, I'd like to introduce what my colleagues and I have accomplished so far. Uh, on Ju June 11th this year, the House of Counselors unanimously passed a resolution on treatment of Taiwan at the World Health Organization. With all participants, including ruling parties and opposing parties, without any exception, supported Taiwan's participation. This resolution points out that in order to end the outbreak of COVID-19, it is essential to share Taiwan's leading knowledge and experience of public health achievement with the rest of the world. We also pointed out that the fact that Taiwan, which has made pioneering efforts to strengthen its quarantine system, is unable to participate in the WHO meetings is a global loss, everyone's loss, in terms of international quarantine. The House also expressed its strong concern about the current situation where Taiwan is not allowed to participate as an observer in the World Health Assembly and urged the countries concerned to take Taiwan's participation in the next assembly. Last week, December 9th, five days ago, uh, in the Diet, Japanese Diet, I uh, myself raised the issue to Prime Minister. I made um, 30 minutes speeches with questionnaire aimed to Prime Minister um, that was uh, nationwide broadcasted. And during my speech and questionnaires to Prime Minister, um, I raised this WHO issue. In response, he re responded to saying, clear stating, Japan has consistently advocated at the WHO that there should not be geographical vacuum in addressing international health issues and has consistently supported Taiwan's participation as an observer at the World Health Assembly. In the case of infectious diseases such as COVID-19, that has an enormous enormous impact on the world, entire world, I believe that it is important to share information and knowledge from countries and regions around the world, including regions like Taiwan, that has taken effective measures to combat COVID-19 and achieved positive results in a free, transparent, and prompt manner. We will continue to work on WHO in collaboration with the relevant countries. In this regard, not only those who are involved in national politics, but also many local Japanese people share a common desire to, uh, that Taiwan should not be left as a blank zone in the global network for infection disease control. In March last year, the Hyogo Prefectural Assembly, which is one of the 47 prefectural assemblies in Japan, anonymously passed a written opinion calling for Taiwan's participation as an observer in the World Health Assembly. This was nation's first written opinion 
at the prefectural assembly level. Since then, 37 out of 47 prefectural assemblies have passed similar resolutions one after another by November this year. I'd like to make the voices of these local communities more open and visible to the people of Japan and the world. Speaking of the Olympics, Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics this summer, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation for your heartful corporations. And to be honest, it, for Japan, it was a huge challenge to host the games in the, in the midst of COVID-19's outbreak. But it turned out the games were managed without major hindrance. And I became very proud when the all athletes from all over the world who participated in the games expressed their gratitude that we can do together. The Japanese team won a record 48 medals, as you know, the world champion in the number of medals won was a dear friend, the United States. I was also happy to hear that Taiwan won a record number of medals this time. Congratulations, my dearest friends. The other day, I attended a reception in Tokyo to com commemorate the double 10th day. I remember with deep impression with that Dr. Frank She Chen Tin, the representative of Taiwan to Japan said, China calls Taiwan as its core interest, but Taiwan is not interest. Taiwan is not their interest. Taiwan is life itself. Taiwan is substantial existence of itself. As a member of diet responsible for protecting the lives and property and dignity of people, I was deeply impressed by this way of thinking. According to the survey conducted last year, more than 70% of Japanese people feel close to Taiwan. Japanese people's feeling for their Taiwanese friends have reached a level of maturity after a long history of exchanges. I believe that this circle of friendship between Japan and Taiwan and the US has strengthened and will continue to expand after the recent new COVID-19 crisis in the Tokyo Olympics. Lastly, I'd like to express, emphasize that peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is extremely important for Japanese people who feel close to Taiwan. Moreover, the distance between Taiwan and Yonaguni Island in Okinawa Prefecture is only 110 kilometers. The fundamental value we uphold does not accept any attempt to unlateral action to change the status quo with force. I am convinced that such an approach will never be able to win over the hearts and minds of all people who have grown up in a mature democratic society. I sincere hope that this forum will continue to develop as an important platform for such solidarity and communication among the diet members of the United States and Taiwan and my country, Japan. Although I appreciate digital equipment, equipment that enables us to have this online conference, I sincerely hope that we can have a face-to-face -face heartful conference together in near future. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is a talk from Tokyo, Japan. Thank you. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for your interesting comment. Uh, now, I think uh, all our speakers has uh, finished their uh, comment and their talks. And I like to uh, express our uh, real sincere appreciation to each participant this morning. Uh, giving us such a real wonderful comment uh, regarding to how in the next maybe several years how much or how we can proceed to make the uh, three countries be able to bind uh, even stronger together to create 
a better living condition and environment for the rest of the world. Now, today I think uh, time is quite limited, but uh, uh, I wonder if uh, uh, there is any questions from the floor, so uh, maybe we can take, maybe take up only one, because time is quite uh, limited by now. Are there any questions that you want to ask our, our uh, presenters? Seems uh, everybody is very satisfied. No questions. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah? I can see. Is there, is there anyone? Hi. I okay, yeah, please, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Um, okay. Thank you for all the speakers for um, all the great uh, remarks. My name is Eric Lee from the Project 2049 Institute. Um, and to uh, the Congresswoman's earlier comment on um, the Town Relations Act, uh, it talks about the uh, the United States has, um, you know, has, has to maintain the capacity to re, uh, to resist the resort to the use of force. And the second part is other forms of coercion. So I think uh, Legislator Law's comments on um, countering coercion in all its forms, political, diplomatic, economic, are of utmost importance. And the discussion of action, um, the strategy and action, is I think the most critical moment, because uh, the most critical part, because this is happening right now. Um, the discussion on invasion, that is um, somewhat in the future, but coercion is happening today. So I'd like to ask any of the panelists um, concrete actions. I know that there's discussion on um, the World Health Organization, but what can the United States, uh, Taiwan, and Japan do to counter any forms of uh, military coercion and economic coercion, such as um, you know, hastening the speed that Taiwan can replenish its um, uh, spare parts for its aircraft, or other um, military equipment, or to you know, um, any discussions of supporting uh, Taiwan's um, uh, supply chain restructuring as needed, or what the Congresswoman said earlier on um, this mechanism to act quickly. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear more action about how all three countries can work together. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks for your uh, questions. Uh, I wonder if. Uh, any one of our speakers would like to respond or take the shot? <laughs> you want to take it? <laughs> if I may, I think, uh, why don't we start with the easier one? That is, I think all three countries should try to engage in a very extensive, intensive dialogues on all you know, uh, dimensions. You, know, uh, so for, you may know that uh, Taiwan has been engaging in all kinds of security dialogues with our US counterparts starting from the strategic level, defense level, economic cooperation, and so on. But uh, in terms of our relations with Japan, uh, we have more to do, you know, especially on the security dialogues. And this kind of dialogue, which is track two, track one, and two, half dialogue, is very useful. But uh, I think it's about time for us to engage in dialogues between our two, two countries at the government levels. And as, a, member, as a, a director of the International Affairs Department at the Democratic Progressive Party, uh, I'm very happy uh, to see that we are quite now innovative in creating new way of dialoguing to each other. For instance, in August this year, uh, Liberal Democratic Party and the DPP held the f for the first time the party to party, a ruling party to ruling party security dialogue. That's our type of two plus two, two, plus two dialogue. And I think that's a very innovative and very uh, uh, you know, fruitful discussion between our two countries. So starting with the dialogues, starting with the discussions about what we can do together, and then we can come up with a, you know, you know, uh, concerted actions that we can you know, uh, work together. So I think dialogues is very important. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think uh, time is really tight and uh, time is up. So I appreciate very much of uh, the response and the uh, question from the uh, floor. So I think I have to conclude this session. Thank you again very, very much. And thank you again to our speakers, yeah, all of you. Thank you very much. Bye.